I will now talk about the IO7. And uh, IO7 is the part of the ELSA project in which we work to produce guidelines on using interlingual life subtitling in live events, in education, uh, and on TV. Uh, IO7 received contributions from the whole ELSA team and also from people outside the project. Uh, for instance, our thanks go to Zoe Moores for her input and many, many more people who assisted us. Uh, IO7 was managed by the Polish part of the ELSA family, uh, including University of Warsaw and the Stempli.eu. And you can see here from the left that Agnieszka Szarkowska, Wojciech Figiel, Monika Szygielska, uh, and me. For many years, we've been talking to colleagues from the accessibility field, to various stakeholders, uh, and again and again, there was this issue that accessibility is at times too complex and too difficult to implement. So uh, ILSA wants to help with that. Uh, our aim was to produce publications, documents, uh, that offer guidance that is easy to understand and easy to impl implement. Uh, and our main focus at ILSA is interlingual. Uh, like subtitling, for instance, when I speak in Polish and you see the text in English, that would be interlingual. Uh, but as we wanted to offer maximum benefit, we also uh, decided to include intralingual, same language, like subtitling uh, in our guidelines. Um, uh, IO7 is the last part uh, of the ILSA project, uh, and in a way, it's our attempt uh, to capture the gold, as I call it. So throughout the years, the project uh, has lasted three years, we gathered uh, an immense body of knowledge and now uh, we want to offer it to as many people as possible in as simple and accessible form uh, as possible. And uh, we chose to focus on three settings. Uh, in many countries, live subtitling is mostly used on television and it has a long tradition there. However, even in such places, there are broadcasters, especially smaller ones, who struggle with providing live subtitling, and there might be even bigger broadcasters who might deal successfully with intralingual, same language subtitling, but they struggle with interlingual live subtitling. And of course, today, television moves to the internet, so now live online streaming providers also need guidance on how to provide live subtitling. So that's one setting, one area we focused on. Uh, another one is live events. There's a huge demand for accessibility services in live events. Event organizers are struggling with this, and so we wanted to help them. And finally, education is important for us uh, at ILSA. Uh, we want education to become more accessible as well, uh, many higher education institutions are now looking into ways in which they can support the deaf students, the hard of hearing students, the international students uh, with speech to text interpreting. Uh, who do we want to reach with those uh, publications? So our first uh, set of guidelines is focused on education. And uh, we address it to accessibility managers at higher education institutions, uh, university decision makers, uh, lecturers and trainers, and anyone who wants higher education to become more accessible. Uh, another publication uh, is focused on live events. And we address it to live event organizers, accessibility managers, including those at public institutions, and anyone who wants the event they organize to become more accessible. Our third uh, publication is focused on television and is addressed to TV broadcasters, live online streaming providers, and anyone who wants television to become more accessible. Uh, users of television subtitling and their organizations can also use the publication to learn more about the specifics of this uh, service. All three uh, documents, all three publications that we're producing follow the same structure. Uh, so they start with definitions, then they discuss the users of the service, they talk about the benefits that this service can bring, the workflows 
that are necessary to produce life subtitling, the toolbox, that is what tools there are that you can use to produce life subtitling, uh, challenges and possible solutions, and finally do's and don'ts. Uh, the documents also include uh, a section with some guidance on what more you can uh, read, where to look for other sources if you want to uh, find out even more details. Uh, as I said, all the documents start with definitions. Uh, we decided to provide clear definitions to all the terms that we are using in our publications and we hope that this will be uh, helpful. Uh, we felt this need uh, to uh, pay attention to definitions because, uh, as you might have noticed even today, terminology varies between countries. It can be quite complex and it can be confusing. So here at ILSA we use terms such as live titling, uh, but, in many, uh, but many other people know it by different names, including speech-to-text interpreting, speech-to-text captioning, live subtitling, live captioning, and so on. Uh, so it was important for us to help our readers deal with all that complex uh, terminology. Uh, we also prepared checklists uh, for speakers, broadcasters, accessibility managers, lecturers, and a few other groups. Uh, and we believe checklists can be a tool of great value. Uh, and it seems uh, that this is confirmed by this event. There have been uh, quite a few questions about checklists. Uh, with all the bits of knowledge and all the complexity involved in uh, live subtitling, especially interlingual, it is easy to get lost and forget about something important. And here the checklist comes to your rescue and guides you through the whole process. Uh, let's now have a look at an example of such a checklist. Uh, this one is addressed at accessibility managers at higher education institutions. Uh, you can go through it point by point, uh, making sure that you will remember about all the important steps you need to take, and you can check the boxes uh, one by one. So if you are an accessibility manager at a university and you want some of your lectures to be accessible with uh, live subtitling, uh, what you have to do is first you find out what are the needs of the users, do they need uh, subtitling or maybe uh, sign language interpreting. Do foreign students need subtitling in a specific language? Uh, can your IT infrastructure support the service? Uh, you should also contact the lecturers, the people whose classes uh, will uh, be made accessible with this service. Uh, and you should make sure that you share the information because very often what we see happening is that institutions offer a service uh, but people don't find the information about it and don't know they can actually uh, use, this, use this. So this checklist can take you uh, sort of by hand the whole uh, process uh, step by step. Uh, as live titling uh, or live subtitling workflows can be quite complex, uh, we put a lot of thought and effort into explaining it in, in an accessible way in our publications. Here you can see graphics that illustrate differences between two interlingual workflows. So on the left, if you have a look at the graphic on your left, you can see there's a speaker who, let's say, speaks English. And then there's an interpreter who translates speech from English into Polish. And then there's uh, Polish being my mother tongue, so that's how, why I'm using it uh, for this example. Then there's a speaker who reformulates that into the microphone, and this is turned into text. And then there's a person, an editor or a corrector, who corrects any errors, any misrecognitions in the text. And then you have the final product displayed to the users. So this is one possible workflow for creating interlingual titles in another language. But another workflow is also possible that we illustrate on the right. So there's an interlingual re-speaker. You no longer need an interpreter, but you have an interlingual re-speaker, somebody we call a trans-speaker. Someone, for instance, trained with the ILSA course uh, that can go from one language to the other without the need for interpreter. So you have less people involved, and crucially, uh, this minimizes the delay with which the text is displayed to the users. And this is very important for the users to get it as soon as uh, possible. 
Here you can see another set of graphics that illustrate differences between re-speaking on site and remotely. Uh, the recent coronavirus pandemic made it an urgent need for re-speakers to be able to work remotely as many events moved online. Uh, surely you experienced it yourself. Uh, and people were afraid, re-speakers were also afraid to travel and work on site. Uh, so working remotely became uh, even more important. Uh, as life cycling practices are diverse and vary between different countries and territories, we took care to select lots of visual examples from different uh, countries. Uh, and mm, I hope by now you are looking forward to reading uh, our publications. Uh, the guidelines, uh, you, you have a sort of a sneak peek at them. Uh, the guidelines are now almost ready. At this stage, we're working hard on producing beautiful and accessible uh, PDFs. And uh, I have some good news for you. Now that you joined us for this ILSA event, you will be uh, the first to receive our guidelines. We will reach out using the email addresses you shared with us when registering for this event, and we will share with you all these publications. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask. And that's all for this presentation. Okay, thank you so much um, for your talk. Uh, I, let's have a look at the chat box. Are there any questions? Okay, can you elaborate on the toolbox of live interlingual subtitling? Uh, sure. So this is something you can learn more. Uh, there are lots of details on this in our publications. Uh, the toolbox depends on the settings, so whether it's uh, education. Uh, for instance, in education, uh, we talk about different speech recognition tools, uh, different speech recognition software that you can use, uh, but also about subtitling uh, tools. So what tools or platforms you can use to make and those live titles uh, displayed to your students at your institution, uh, whether it's something on a big screen or it's something online as today. Today we are using the text on top uh, software or whether it's something that uh, students access locally on their tablets, laptops, mobile phones and so on. So there are lots of different um, solutions uh, that we discuss in, the, in, in a lot of detail in those publications. Okay, thank you. How many languages does this project support? Um, could you... I think, yes, I think this, this is a, a, a question that appears again, but a very important mm -hmm. one. Um, so I think it's important to receive, to understand, sorry, it's important to understand that uh, we wanted ELSA to be as universal as possible. And within ILSA, what we give you are tools for training uh, and also we share the knowledge uh, and the practices and the checklists and so on, all, all sorts of different tools with you. And this is all universal. We wanted it to be as universal as possible so you can try to use it for whatever language and whatever country. Then when it comes to speech recognition systems, they will differ country by country, language by language, and ILSA itself was not responsible for actually producing speech recognition. We're just using it as a tool. Uh, so you need to find your own speech recognition uh, that works for your language, and then you can use all the knowledge from ILSA, all the tools, all the training materials to train live uh, interlingual uh, subtitlers or uh, to become one to train yourself. And you can use our publications to educate others about the need for the service and how to implement it. Uh, and it will also help you if you want to have the service in your institution, be it university, television, or just uh, you're an institution that organizes live, live events. All right, thank you. Any other questions?
to what extent do you think the project outputs are accurate? So, what do you could you please uh, specify the question? What do you mean by accurate? While we wait for more details of this question, I think you can see from previous presentations by Haley and by Zeus and by others that all the materials that we tested, we actually consulted them uh, with other experts. Uh, uh, we tested those materials with students. Uh, so we really put a lot of effort into producing the best quality of content that we could. And we checked it with others. We tested it with students. So we do believe it is an accurate and useful and good quality content that we are sharing with you. Okay, um, Lukas, I, I imagine you can see the question in the check box? Yes, sure. So there's a question uh, uh, by uh, from Charlotte. Uh, what, if any, are the additional challenges of remote re-speaking over on-site re-speaking? Uh, sure, so we are explaining that in, in our publication. So uh, if you are on site, it's much easier for you as a re-speaker or as a corrector to get audio. Uh, you might be sitting in, a, in the same room in a, sort of, in a booth uh, or using a steno mask and then you just see the people in the room and it's all quite easy uh, for you to get the audio to hear and to see what is happening. Whereas when you work remotely, you need to find ways to get audio over some teleconferencing systems or maybe over a phone, uh, a messaging app like Messenger, WhatsApp. So there are different ways. Uh, so you need to get audio. Some people also uh, prefer for the comfort to have a video of the event so they know what is happening. Uh, and then you need to be able to send those the text that you're creating uh, with as little delay as possible uh, so that this then displayed in, 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 in online during an online meeting, as, as you can see the text being displayed today. And then for uh, those settings where you would have a re-speaker uh, and a corrector, they need a way to collaborate. So they need a, a way for the corrector to see the text before the users, the participants see it, be able to quickly correct the errors, the misrecognitions, and then make it available to the users. And as we mentioned previously in other presentations, re-speakers are not superhuman, so they cannot go on working forever. So for longer events, you would need to have a team of two re-speakers that take turns. So they need to have a way to communicate with each other. Apart from hearing the event, they need to be able to hear themselves and have a way to communicate turn-taking. Where how do you know that now I stop re-speaking and my colleague is uh, uh, going on with this task. So the, all these challenges uh, are a bit more uh, difficult uh, when it comes to doing it remotely. It's of course possible and there are also advantages to remote work, like you, you can work from home, you have no risk of contracting the virus and so on, you don't have to drive or travel, commute to long distances to an event. But yes, working remotely is, uh, is a bit more challenging, there are some more difficulties than working on site. Uh, then there are more questions. So could you explain how the re-speaker and the corrector collaborate uh, technically? Uh, so uh, as the re-speaker re-speaks, uh, the corrector would see the text produced by the speech recognition. If they are in the same place, uh, they can also easily communicate. So the re-speaker sometimes makes a mistake and might have a way, a gesture or a voice command to show to the corrector that it's a mistake that the re-speaker uh, misspoke something and doesn't. It's not a correct thing, and this, this needs to be. Uh, this needs to be fixed. Uh, so, 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 so. This, there's also a few different ways for them to uh, cooperate. And then, if if they do that remotely, it's also a bit more tricky how, how they could communicate uh, uh, within between themselves, the corrector and the re-speaker. Then, Luis is asking. How long is, uh, 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 sorry, uh, Daniela said sound transfer is the major challenge for remote, and uh, I agree. And then being able to, to find ways uh, to collaborate, this is something you need to practice. 
uh, it can be done, but you need to process it. And then Luis asks, how long is long uh, for a trans speaker? Uh, so uh, generally, we uh, there might be differing views. Uh, I believe that three speakers and trans speakers should uh, have a break after uh, as many as 30 minutes. So you should not be working for more than 30 minutes, speaking nonstop for more than 30 minutes without having a break. Uh, you need to have a break for your brain, for your throat, maybe for going to the toilet, drink water. Uh, so I, I wouldn't recommend. Uh, there's also an official recommendation, there are also publications, uh, and I would say that we speakers should not uh, work longer than 30 minutes without having a break. So they need to have a colleague who can take turns, who, with whom they can change turns. And then for some short events, sometimes people work for 40, 50 minutes. Uh, non-stop work for longer events certainly you need to have to to re speakers and when you do trans speaking it's actually more challenging um, uh, I don't want to go into too much details but you can compare that with interpreters uh, as you know in most countries the professional practices for interpreters to work uh, in pairs a team of two interpreters uh, and they should, are not working for longer than 30 minutes without having a break uh, and as trans speaking is as difficult or even more difficult than interpreting, uh, it should be the same uh, for trans speakers. Uh, that's what I uh, believe. And Daniela says that we do turn taking every 15 minutes. Yes, if you have to three speakers or trans speakers, you might actually prefer to take turns uh, more often, uh, as this can produce an even better uh, quality. Uh, there are some re-speakers who do believe they are superhuman, and uh, sometimes people believe that they can go on working forever. They just don't realize that the quality of what they are producing is suffering. So as a good practice, we discourage uh, re-speakers working alone. The only exception would be a short event, uh, uh, less than an hour. Okay, and uh, Mohammed is then asking, what if the inter internet connection is not good enough to transfer the message uh, on site? Yes, yeah, so this is a challenge, uh, for instance, in education settings in, at university campuses. It's something you need to check your IT infrastructure. But generally, uh, I just want to point out that transferring text itself is not a problem because text does not consume a lot of bandwidth. It's more uh, difficult with transferring audio and video and if you have participated in some online events and probably you have in many many of them in the past months you notice how often people struggle with video and audio connections so this is a challenge transferring text itself is not that uh, challenging as it, as it requires much less uh, bandwidth and in now with internet with mobile networks, it's, it's usually not that big of a problem, at least in cities. Of course, in other places, it might be an issue. I don't see any further questions in the comments, but maybe I missed something. So if you could, if you can point out any questions that I missed. Wojtek is explaining that if you're a green speaker, you need fast download speeds. So maybe just to conclude on this, uh, I know that the re speakers I work with uh, they actually, for everyday life, they use their Wi-Fi connections, but when they are working as re-speakers remotely, they actually connect the cables. Uh, they, they connect the, inter the internet cable to their computer, connecting the computer to the router to get an even faster connection than what Wi-Fi allows. And they experience it's more stable, the signal is more stable over a cable rather than wirelessly through your home's Wi-Fi network.